He called himself the uncandidate. Governor, what made you decide to go into politics? What attracted you? What attracted me? I don't know. I mean, it just seemed like an interesting thing to do. And uh, what I'd known about it, my father was in politics. I suppose if my father was a doctor, I might have become a doctor. He happened to have been a lawyer and a governor, so I became a lawyer and a governor. Running, not running, talking about running, and then, like a firecracker, like nothing one political consultant said he had ever seen before. The new governor of California, two years in, a Buddhist, who refused to live in the governor's mansion, spent four years in a Jesuit seminary, a follower of Eugene McCarthy and Cesar Chavez, currently dating a rock star who would open up his political rallies. The governor lives in a bachelor apartment in this block next to the Capitol and pays the $250 a month rent out of his own pocket. He refused to move into the sprawling new governor's mansion that Ronald Reagan had built and has handed it over to the state to find some other useful purpose for it. So private, yet so public, so different from anything, flew in a coach seat, sold the governor's jet brought only one overworked press secretary on his presidential campaign who simply told reporters he didn't know what was going on because he didn't know what the governor was going to do next. But he wanted to be president of the United States, and he had decided, it seemed like, just last week. And to become president of the United States in this year, his mission could be summed up in two words. Stop Carter. few things I want to remind you of. Website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Our Twitter is at myhist, M-Y-H-I-S-T. We have a Facebook group, fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Run a search on Facebook for it. Go ahead and join. Like us on Facebook on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics page and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps the show's rankings been around a long time there's a lot of other podcasts now so that's become increasingly important jerry brown was late getting in by april 1976 there had already been a lot of action in the democratic primary some said there was already a nominee Certainly, the leading nominee said it. There had already been several primaries, and candidates of stature had exited the race. I started my own campaign 21 months ago. I didn't have any political organization, not much money. Nobody knew who I was. We began to go from one living room to another, one labor hall to another, up and down the streets, factory shift lines, barbershops, beauty parlors, restaurants, shaking hands, talking to people, and listening. Jimmy Carter, who had a 2% name recognition in 1975, only doubling that to 4% in January 1976, was heading towards the nomination of his party now. The race was supposed to be between Arizona Senator Mo Udall and Washington Senator Henry Scoop Jackson. Mo Udall, popular with liberals. I was up in New Hampshire and then in Massachusetts, and we ran good, strong second races. But I was reminded of that uh, famous patriot, maybe it was Nelson Rockefeller, who once said, uh, (laughs) said, I said, I've been rich and I've been poor, and believe me, rich is best. Scoop Jackson with Hawks. He made his profile by speaking out on Soviet-U.S. relations for a hard line on the Soviets. And if we can't implement uh, international law, that we'll 
honor the right of a person to leave a country freely and return freely, just as clear as anything can be. If we don't have enough moral courage to do that, I think we're in pretty bad shape. And yet he was a strong supporter of many liberal issues and civil rights. So it was a bit of a mix there. He was considered a front runner. But there were still a lot of Democrats who felt that the 1968 nominee and the former vice president, Hubert Humphrey, was going to get in and should get in. Came close, almost beat Nixon in 68, even with all that baggage. A draft Humphrey campaign was started, but Humphrey didn't say a word. Jimmy Carter was not so silent. He focused on Iowa, staging TV events, local TV in, in parts of Iowa. His nine-year-old Amy was featured, his wife, Rosalind, his mother, Lillian. Local Georgians came to Iowa, asking the people for their trust. Udall and Jackson battled each other, liberal versus hawk. Jackson had always had a good relationship with labor unions and wanted their support. And some of them, few of them, did support him. But many stayed out. They were holding out for Humphrey, and more than a few were holding out for Ted Kennedy. Carter was something new. The anti-Nixon in a time of Watergate. He exuded personality, even though Gallup polls showed him low in terms of people agreeing with his issues. They liked him. 69% viewed him as personable, something important in 1976 in these primaries, because though you never heard the word electability formed in these times, at least I haven't seen a lot of evidence of it, 31% of Americans didn't think Ford was personable. This was a big argument for Carter. In 1974, Time magazine said it this way, Carter faces an uphill fight for the White House since he lacks both foreign policy experience and an active political base. Although he has cultivated a reformer's image by declining campaign contributions larger than $1,000, Carter will have to work to make his name recognized by more voters. He plans on 250 days of campaigning next year, during which he will rely on a savvy brand of political toughness underneath his populist courtly charm. Time magazine didn't get much hope for this also ran in a really crowded field in 1974, but by 1976, courtly charm worked. Jimmy Carter won Iowa, then won New Hampshire, made the cover of that same magazine for doing that. But this was a strange year. So many unknown candidates. Maybe this Jimmy Carter thing was a fluke. Indeed, the first 11th of that, perhaps, he loses Massachusetts. That's a major Democratic state. But Carter wins Vermont. And then Illinois. Despite his folksy farm image, he's really tight with big city boss, Richard Daly. Then he wins Florida. Then he wins North Carolina. This is important because in those states, Carter beats George Wallace. Still running in 1976, but more of a burden for the party. And many insiders want nothing to do with him. Carter wins more. Kansas and Virginia. But these, people argue, are red states. Well, they don't say red states then. These are states that Republicans, either Reagan or Ford, whoever wins the 76 contest, are probably going to win anyway. Udall thinks he has them. He's not going to let anyone just quickly stampede to the party's nomination. Wisconsin is going to be the shootout. And for a moment, you Dahl thinks he has him. In fact, he even gives a victory speech. Well, let me tell you, I finished second. And tonight I finished first, and I like first a lot better. But it's all for naught. Carter, the unknown governor of a small state with a broad smile, a Sunday school teacher's morality, warns Wisconsin eating up the delegates. Jackson and Udall got discouraged. And many were giving up on them. Labor unions converged on the state of Pennsylvania. This is where they'll stop them. And you start hearing this term in the press, stop Carter. Edward M. Kennedy said yesterday that Jimmy Carter was being intentionally indefinite and imprecise on many issues. But the Massachusetts Democrat hedged on whether he was part of a stop Carter movement. Mr. Carter has, in appearances before the Democratic Platform Committee, intentionally made his positions on some issues indefinite and imprecise, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Kennedy told reporters. 
but the center dismissed reports that he was part of any active Stop Carter movement or that he was running himself. He said, and one could interpret this two ways, either as a definitive statement or a little coy, I cannot stop any speculation, and I suppose there will continue to be speculation until the last vote is taken at the Democratic Convention. Heck of a way to take yourself out of a presidential race, right, by asserting that you won't be out of contention, at least in the talk, until the last vote of the convention. Scoop Jackson picks up a few direct endorsements of unions and groups that are ensconced in the Democratic politics of Pennsylvania, connected to its machines in in Philadelphia and its suburbs, some of the industrial areas. But most unions, still hoping Humphrey or Kennedy get in, they don't want to back a candidate. They, they're telling people, you know, not to let's try to stop Carter, but they don't want to back any one candidate. The strategy didn't really work. Here's what a, off the record, a key local official of the United Steelworkers of America said. Too many people sat on their hands for too long. You know, when we got the word to get out the vote for Jackson to keep Carter from looking good, it was the Friday before the primary on Tuesday. Said another, no one likes to vote for a stalking horse. My people also don't like all these stories in the newspapers about people ganging up on Carter to stop him. It gives him an issue. Carter won Pennsylvania, which is not a southern state, and he won huge. He carried 65 of 67 counties, all except Philadelphia and Montgomery in the Philadelphia suburbs. He defeated Scoop Jackson by 170,000 votes and 12 percentage points, 37 to 25. Pennsylvania really helps the seal for Carter because it influences what's going to happen at other states. The only thing opposing Carter at this point, besides the weak campaigns of Udall and Jackson, are a series of favorite son candidates where a governor or a senator will run, like Robert Byrd in West Virginia, or Lloyd Benson in Texas, who are running for president really just to keep those delegates open in the convention. But in Texas, after the Pennsylvania win, Lloyd Benson isn't able to keep his favorite son campaign going. Many of those delegates want to switch to Carter. Why? Why? Well, look at the current campaign that we're seeing in 2020, right? Um, You start with not knowing where things are going, and now it looks like probably Biden, unless something happens. And People are looking to join. They want to to go with the momentum. There's also going to be a president in the White House, and that's whether there's specific promises made or not. People want to be on the train early. Jimmy Carter, after Pennsylvania, was jubilant. He directly confronts these amorphous Stop Carter critics. He has no problem, he said, with anybody who's directly running for president. They're my opponents, and they're honestly running for president. But we have seen this campaign come full circle from Jimmy Who. 16 months ago, to stop Carter. The people who ignored me are opposing me now. He blasts the Stop Carter movement. My critics don't want to stop Carter. They want to stop the reforms I'm committed to. I've gone to the people with my positions on every basic issue facing the nation. Tax reform, health, welfare reform, the environment, jobs, government reorganization, honesty in government. And in state after state, the people have endorsed my positions. My opponents are struggling to maintain at all costs their entrenched, unresponsive, bankrupt, irresponsible political power. And they're ganging up on me. Not everyone agreed with this uh, contention, uh, namely his rivals. Frank Church of Idaho, a senator who's also running, said, Nobody ever promised him a rose garden. But Carter was impressing people, including President Ford, who maybe, just maybe, was licking his lips, picking an opponent of his choosing, and throwing a little elbow at Democrats while doing that. I don't see how the Democratic smoke-filled rooms in New York can take the nomination away from Carter. Hmm. Did we think that play of a president interfering in another party's election with some statements was new? The insiders kept saying there'll still be a convention battle. Humphrey will get in, maybe Kennedy. Carter loses New York. He loses West Virginia. He loses Nebraska. But he's still the most national candidate of any. 
Not always winning huge, but he's coming in second in a lot of places and scraping up delegates. Even the last party nominee, McGovern, bastion of the left, whose politics were different from Carter, is forced to react when his press secretary, Alan Barron, kind of not just a press secretary, but also a figure on the left of this time, made some anti-Carter remarks. A lot of our people see Carter as a positive evil, surrounded by a staff committed to no ideals, like Haldeman and Ehrlichman, referring to Nixon's aides. Calling Carter evil, at least in 1976, within the party, was a little too much, and McGovern was forced to fire Barron. Barron, of course, saw it as clamping down on his free speech. It's regrettable, he said, that Governor Carter and his supporters have found our dissent and our principles so dangerous that they felt compelled to bring pressure to McGovern. McGovern said he felt no pressure, of course, but some believe that, some did not. Mo Udall also was critiquing Carter's stopping of the Stop Carter movement. The Carter people are clever, Udall said. They win in Pennsylvania and they tell you to lie down, go away. You're unpatriotic if you don't. I rejected that. Now they want to make me feel guilty because I have a common interest with other candidates. In stopping Jimmy Carter, well, I won't. If you mow your lawn and get rid of the dandelions, it makes your neighbors look nice too. So what can they do, though, at this point? doesn't seem like it's working to get out the old labor cannons, the old political machines. Carter's beating that. People want something new. Can't beat him with a senator or a Washington politico. A new model candidate appears, and it seems designed for this situation. It's not Humphrey, it's not Udall, it's not McGovern. It's a governor, son of a governor, as well. The kind of straight talking that Jerry Brown engages in is something we expect from young theoreticians, not from elected officials, particularly the governor of the most populous state in the Union. He's a phenomenon of sorts because as a result of his promising less, he's the most popular governor the state's ever known. All you have to do is look at your grocery bill, your medical bill, your utility bill, your rent, your taxes, and it's just a, a fact of a life in this country that just to stay where we are, we have to try a lot harder. And I think people appreciate someone in government being honest with them and telling them that this is the way it's going to be instead of promising rosy tomorrows uh, with no pain and no uh, sacrifice, because that's not the way it's going to be. Here's what Time Magazine says about Jerry Brown. His style is certainly fresh. He declines Secret Service protection, rides in a rented van, and brusquely turns down little gifts, even a necktie, painted with a presidential seal that was proffered by an executive of a garment factory. The Western Electric Plant outside Baltimore, he created pandemonium. Men pressed forward to shake his hand. Women squealed and virtually swooned. He's got the greatest eyebrows I've ever seen. Comparisons with the Kennedy brothers are obvious, yet, and only add to the enigma of the bachelor who lives in a sparsely furnished apartment and seems most comfortable talking about philosophy. Governor Brown chooses one location to fight this battle, this late battle, with the front runner Jimmy Carter, who he now considers to be kind of the establishment. He descends on Baltimore, always with press, went to Baltimore's Lexington Market, but he didn't do sort of the culinary populism like eat a pizza here, eat a kibasi there. When a Polak Johnny sausage was wrapped up and given to an aide, he accepted it, but there's no evidence the governor ate it. It might not be in his diet. They scooted off for an audience with a Politico? No, with Muhammad Ali. At the meeting, Ali seemed to be in some sort of a trance. He had virtually no idea what Jerry Brown was doing there meeting with him. Ali joked about himself becoming president. When a reporter asked Brown, why are you doing this? Brown said, why do we do any of these things? His surreal to their surreal. The crowds came out for him in Maryland, including several during a downpour. The crowds were excited, during, and responsive to his theme that we need a new generation of leadership. 
a president who is young. Oh, yes. Jerry Brown was just 38 at this point. He's a really odd sight. There's very few Buddhists in Baltimore, he says, as he walks the streets. This uncandidate was out cartering Carter. Why do you wait so late to get in, he's asked. Well, I waited for Mr. Carter's proposals, and I saw that his only superficial adjustments in government had not caught the imagination of the American people. Jerry Brown had been an odd governor for a Democrat in the 1970s, post-Watergate, post-Nixon, a younger person. What people expected from him in California was different from what he delivered. One of the realities that we're facing is the state is assuming the role that was previously uh, played by the family. The state is supposed to provide child care. It's supposed to provide meals. It's supposed to provide food stamps. It's supposed to provide nursing homes. Uh, you name it. Uh, the next thing we're supposed to do is give workman's compensation for wives. Uh, and maybe that's a good idea. But when you cost out all the things that people used to do for free, and we take care of our parents, take care of our kids, educate them. That's what we used to do maybe 50 years ago. Now you put that all on to the state and you pay people a decent wage for doing it. Uh, the cost is astronomical and not even the United States of America can afford to pay the bill. Uh, here's what one newspaper account said. He suspects that America is experiencing a counter-reformation against the expansive governmental policies of the past few years. In his first term in office, he curbed growth in his state's burgeoning government employment and spending. At one point, he actually takes his predecessor, Governor Ronald Reagan, for a task that his rhetoric doesn't match his reality. He never slowed anything down. He was a strange fellow, an unusual politician, out newing the new candidate, out adoring the press that was had been adoring Carter. But that was months ago. He was a shinier star. Here's Time Magazine comparing his physical features even to Carter. Brown is brushed with star quality. It's almost tangible as he races through a factory. His mouth, unlike Jimmy Carter's, does not rest in a smile. He speaks in lean sentences, quotes Aristotle, the Bible, and Dylan Thomas. But beneath the service of this kind of new candidate who is a Democrat who could criticize other Democrats, he wasn't born in the cities, like his father was, who was also Governor Pat Brown. He was born in the suburbs. But Rolling Stone caught on to what was really going on in 1976, late in the primary, with this new candidate. As it happened, many of Brown's most devoted supporters in Maryland were not uh, Buddhists, but were members of a bizarre and anachronistic Eastern sect known as Political Hacks. Their credo was, take care of your own and go with a winner when you can. And this California fruitcake seemed like the winner, even though he eschewed the long-held ritual of greasing of the palms. Here's what a key Baltimore politician who was backing Brown against Carter, Theodore TV Teddy Vinatolis, it's no different than handling a nightclub act, said the Baltimore County Executive. But it turns out that in Maryland, Brown had a key friend, one that will be familiar to those of us in politics today. Brown's friend was San Francisco socialite Nancy D'Alessandro, who was the daughter and sister of Baltimore mayors, popular Baltimore mayors. She was well known to Brown, well known to San Franciscans at this point, but she also conveniently had connections in Maryland. Nancy D'Alessandro, we know today as Nancy Pelosi. He made Pelosi just beginning to think she might want a political career of her own, his political director for Maryland. And she helped Brown to connect with Maryland machine politicians. That connection with the old Pauls, plus his new spirit, made him formidable. In fact, Jimmy Carter was getting a bit worried. And 
he scheduled a series of TV ads to tell people in Maryland that the political bosses were using this California strange governor guy. And his TV ad said, a man who said he has no goals in life. They were using him to restore the status quo in politics that Carter was trying to take away. Now, the ads really didn't work well, and Brown had a counter for it. Observing that Carter also welcomed organization support, we mentioned Richard Daly of Chicago. Brown told reporters, You've heard the old biblical expression, In my father's house, there are many machines. Brown feels that he's on a roll, and he suggested that at some point in the Democratic presidential nomination campaign, he and Jimmy Carter are going to have a public debate. But Jerry Brown never wanted to be a typical politician. I am not challenging him to it, but it should happen. And in the Maryland primary, Carter, the front runner, now takes a shellacking from this newcomer. In fact, Brown beats Carter 49% to 37%, beats him across practically the entire demographic spectrum, African Americans, uh, the various counties. In fact, his victory is so big that even the politicos in Maryland and the bosses know that they didn't do it alone. That a lot of it had to be attributed to Brown. Prince George County Executive Winfield Kelly went over to the Maryland governor and said, you didn't do this one. Brown was beaming. I represent a new generation of leadership, a generation that came of age in the civil rights movement and Vietnam. Yes, but he didn't necessarily represent the activists of that generation. More likely, he re represented the observers, the people who were mildly sympathetic to civil rights and anti-war, but were turned off by excesses that might result from those fights. Here's what Rolling Stone said. Jerry Brown's unique inside-outside approach, find some local politicians but also run as the outsider, proved a formula which served Brown well as he won a string of late victories. He wins Maryland, then he wins Nevada, then he wins New Jersey, then Rhode Island, Louisiana, and California, his home state, making him number two, technically, in the 1976 Democratic primary race even though he's only getting in in April. In California, he makes appearances with his father, Pat Brown, and the two had been somewhat estranged, certainly different in politics. His father had supported Hubert Humphrey. Jerry Brown had been for Eugene McCarthy. One newspaper said, Enough has been written about the strained, competitive relationship between father and son. Suffice it to say that Jerry Brown was as reserved as his father was garrulous, as aloof as his father was common. Younger Brown was interested in solving the more abstract, perhaps more threatening problems, like environmentally caused cancer and the rapid depletion of national resources. Ideas come from the fringes into the center of power, Jerry Brown would tell reporters. That's something you're normally used to hearing in a Democratic primary. Observers in Sacramento say that pressure, especially in the media, is the only way to get Brown to do anything. The best way, said a California state legislature, to get to the governor, Jerry Brown, is to get some editorial writer to bang him over the head. Wait, you get to an elected politician by going through the media? Hmm. Well, for Brown, it was a few good weeks anyway. And in the end, it comes down to a technical era. He did very well in the primary of Oregon, but he was not on the ballot. He had entered the race too late, so he had to convince people to vote for him. He sent out brochures, single sheets consisting of a half-profile shot of Brown looking hawkish yet hip, accompanied by two paragraphs of boilerplate about his background and ideas. And he won the college campuses over with his speeches, but he was a write-in candidate, and that's hard for any candidate. And he ends up coming in third. Had he won that primary, it might have given him momentum to either do better or win Ohio, the next big contest. And perhaps with the other candidates for him to get enough delegates to stop Carter. But he started too late. The Georgian was a declared candidate before Jerry Brown took office as governor of California in 75. And he couldn't just jump in immediately after becoming governor. He was forced to wait a little while. But in the stretch that he did, 
Brown badly embarrassed the front runner. Even after Carter had clinched the nomination when he won Ohio June 8, 1976, Brown doesn't quit. Travels the country, needling Carter, picking up a few loose delegates here and there. No one was quite sure what Jerry Brown was going to do next. But at the convention, muscular Democratic National Committee was in place. Having lost in 1972, they weren't going to lose again, and they weren't going to let Brown get any of the goods. Bob Strauss, an old Texas politico, now Washington one, was running things. He had already scrapped with Brown over the convention location. It would be in New York in 76. Miami Beach didn't want another political convention after all the protests and tumult in 72. New Orleans, Kansas City didn't have enough hotel rooms. Los Angeles, the city of angels, was ruled out because Democrats were convinced the governor was crazy. You see, when Democrats came to Los Angeles for the Democratic National Convention Site Selection Committee, the committee that's going to decide where the party's convention will be, the Democratic governor, Jerry Brown, didn't do what a typical politician would do and warm them up and tell them how great his state and his city was. He attacked them as a bunch of big-time spenders looking for luxury hotels. He suggested that the delegates, the committee, should sleep in church basements. Mayor Thomas Bradley of Los Angeles, who was arranging parties at the homes of movie stars, like, was embarrassed. Bob Straw said later, It was New York by default. We were afraid of demonstrations and getting caught up in the image of New York's financial and labor troubles. We tried to figure out a way to go to New Orleans or Kansas City. But then... And this is what Bob Strauss tells Rolling Stone, that little bastard, I couldn't trust him. Why go somewhere where Jerry Brown controls the National Guard? I had visions of riots and him sitting on a mattress and refusing to call out the troops. Jerry Brown goes to New York for the DNC convention, having won 320 or so delegates. But it was too late. Carter had too big of a head start. The other candidates, Udall, Jackson, decide to fall in. Despite all the pressure Humphrey's under, he never enters the race. And the convention is a very pro-Carter convention. Well, it's quite an interesting story to talk about the late primary of 1976. Stop Carter movement. Uh... The establishment, certainly what could be called the establishment of a Democratic Party and a, probably a, arguably a much more powerful party at that point, probably a party that knew it was headed for a presidential win after both Watergate and Nixon's pardon. And maybe even you could add just Ford's general kind of bungling of things and a nasty primary with Reagan. They thought they were coming to power and wanted to a certain type of candidate different from what they got in the primaries that they had set up. And Carter's very interesting because he had been, at least at the DNC 72, part of a Stop McGovern movement. And then there's a movement to stop him afterwards. There were movements to stop Kennedy in 1960. So this is not, you know, this is not a total new thing. I think it is interesting to see that Carter used some of the language that you might hear from perhaps, uh, if not Bernie Sanders himself, maybe a Sanders supporter or some other, one of the other kind of uh, outsider candidates attacking uh, establishment. I think the Pelosi connection is interesting. I think the yearning for a new type of candidate that we see as something probably modern is not necessarily so. And, you know, Jerry Brown certainly wouldn't disappear from politics after uh, what he did in his 30s. He's been a fixture of California politics since then. I want to thank you for listening. Website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com.
You want to see us once again have a nation that's as good and honest and decent and truthful and competent and compassionate and is filled with love as all the American people. He spoke straight and simple, and I began 